Ilan La. And perhaps that would be a good way. If one has to have a television in one's house, I don't have one. I don't think one should have one. But if one has to have one, perhaps that little sticker, you can buy them in some of those bookshops, uh, Muslim bookshops, where they have bumper stickers. If you can buy La Rali bi Ilan La and put it on your television, like a kind of permanent subtitle, mm -hmm. things look better. What's happening in the Haram Sharif in Jerusalem, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring it back to us. La ghali ba illallah. They can't do anything. Allah is fully in control. What's happening in Chechenia, in the Balkans, West Africa, Indonesia, Tajikistan, the other places in the Ummah that we tear our hair out about. La ghali ba illallah. That doesn't mean we don't act. What it does mean is that we act, but without being in a state of panic. And this panic, or jaza is a profoundly antipathetic attitude to the spirit of Islam. Islam is all about acknowledging the one, the omnipotent God. When we really start panicking about the state of the Ummah, we are losing sight of that most fundamental principle. We're letting it slip and imagining that somehow something else is at work in history. And it's not. The Wali, when he looks at the Pentagon, sees La Ghali Ba Illa Allah written all over it. The employees there don't see it, but the Wali can see it. Yeah. On the White House, on the Kremlin Wall, written into every corner of creation, because the creation is absolutely abjectly dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whether, it, you're, whether you're a Sufi or, a not, you, or not, you have to acknowledge that creation is being renewed constantly with every breath. This is what the, the Sufis call tajaddud al-khalq bil anfas With every breath that the Rahman breathes out, the world is renewed. Uh, it's not the world that's prolonging itself. We don't believe in natural causality. Everything is the direct, immediate action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَا You didn't shoot arrows when you shot arrows, it was Allah who shot them. This is the logical conclusion and the beauty and the purity and the consistency of, of pure Islamic monotheism which no other religion still has. And it's, it's, it's alhamdulillah one of, one of the great glories of Islamic theology that we're so clear about this. So, wala ghali ba illallah, God alone is victorious. And if we remember that one text, Inshallah, we'll start to become like those people who la khawfun alayhim wa la just a little bit. And stop worrying and panicking and attacking this faction and attacking that faction and thinking that if only our faction can prevail then somehow the ummah will be unified. All of those boring unity um, events and khutbas almost every week in, in Cambridge. Um, I fear that sometimes they can even hear me groan when the imam gets up and says, Tonight, today brothers we are going to talk about unity. And of course what he means is, it's very easy to achieve Muslim unity if everybody joins my faction, we'll be unified. Huh? That's everybody's logic. Traditional Muslim civilization was unity and diversity. And why was that possible? Why could they get on with each other? Why was there this beautiful harmony between the, the, the Turuq and the wonderful understanding between the four madhabs of Sunni fiqh? A harmony that's really without precedent or parallel in the history of world religions. Why? Because of this principle of Tawheed. They knew that Allah alone is victorious. And everything that points towards Him has to be unifying. Don't worry about the proliferation of Muslim organizations. That's neither here nor there. What counts and what will give the Ummah success is the quality of our hearts. Because Allah who is the one who determines everything that happens in history determines history on the basis of rewarding those who deserve to be rewarded. Not on the basis of this organization having succeeded in getting its community to use the miswak before every prayer. So that, I mean, this is the mentality of some people like some of the Algerians, they really seem to think that Allah hasn't yet given us victory in our great Islamic utopian exercise. Somehow we've got it wrong and we must persuade people to use the miswak even more often. So that even they use the miswak when they're asleep and the thalbs come up and up and up as if we, could, if we could only do a little bit more of this then Allah will give us the victory. There's no sign of it. Allah doesn't respond to that. That's all a necessary manifestation of our love for the founder. 
and our desire to emulate him and his beauty and his perfection and the naturalness of his state of life. But that's not what generates the divine response, which alone can change history. What he looks at is our hearts, the state of our hearts and of our egos. Often in Islamic conferences we hear this Quranic verse, Allah does not change what is in a people until they change what is in their selves. Uh, what it means is anfusihim, that's a plural of nafs. Mm? And it's the Sufis who are the ones who change the nafs. It's not the people who talk about Islamic economics and hizb this and faction that and jama'at this and jama'at that. It's the, the ikhtisas for this is the people of tasawwuf. And where their program works and succeeds, there Allah opens the way and miracles happen and history is, is changed. But where everything is on the basis of how often you scrub your teeth with the miswak, however necessary, legitimate that is, then they don't succeed and they never succeed. To the amazement of the outside world, everybody's astounded that the Algerian radical opposition didn't take power. But they didn't. Why? Because Allah, ghalibun ala amri, I should stop soon. Let me end with uh, one or two final points, provocations perhaps. Again, cause for optimism, once we bear these things in mind. A great theatre of opportunities has opened itself for a largely uncomprehending, unwitting Muslim ummah in the last 30 or 40 years. Traditionally, the civilization which was our nearest rival and deadliest threat has suddenly opened its doors. We can live here. In Cambridge, I can exist. I can worship. We have mosques, a Muslim chaplain, all kinds of Islamic infrastructure springing up. 400 years ago, it would have been burnt at the stake. But it's now possible. In the heartlands of Christendom, things have changed and our message can be heard the Ishmaelite message. It's, I think, something for which we should give profound thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the civilization that prevails in the world has grown out of a religious civilization that historically we have at least been able to understand and talk to, one that the Qur'an directly engages with, namely the Judeo-Christian heritage. If the modern world had originated in, say, Shintoist Japan, and we were forced to live in a basically Japanese world and eat sushi and um, try and figure out what on earth was going on down at the Shinto temple that was dominating Chicago. If, if the Japanese had crossed the, the Pacific instead of the Europeans crossing the Atlantic, that would be our situation. That would have been a thousand times harder for us, because how can we talk to them? No concept of a personal god. Um, it, it, it's almost not religion as we know it. But Allah in his mercy has decided, if we take the opportunity, that the civilization in the midst of which we now find ourselves is the civilization that historically we have been best at appealing to. And that's an opportunity that, inshallah, we will begin now that we are here, finding our feet to use. One last point before we have the, the interaction. <clears throat>